It's time for our Bible drawing. Those that do not know, um, every Sunday morning I go to the Sunday school classes for the youth and the children. And those that are have brought their Bible, I keep track of. Um, and. Um, Bibles I keep track of every Sunday. Their name gets put in King. Um, so every three months we do a drawing for a little something. It's just a little something for them bringing their Bibles. Um, it's been a while back I got with the Brotherhood and um, for those that didn't have a Bible um, we we started getting Bibles for team Bibles for the youth, and um, I noticed before that I noticed that they would they didn't have a, a lot of the teens didn't have a Bible, so we started buying Bibles for them. But we'd buy the Bibles for them, and then they wouldn't bring them. So we started we I started this to get them to bring if they've taken their Bibles, they were more likely to read it. So I started this to encourage them to bring their Bible. So, um, first, last drawing, the winner was not here. So, um, Abby won. So, the last drawing, you were not here. So if you'll come up and get your prize. the 631 rulers. This is for the younger kids. Drum roll. Psalm 127 and 128. 
What a great day. This is a, as we come to the end of summer, we've seen God do amazing things. Uh, of course, summer is a great time in youth and children's ministry because we have vacation Bible school, we have kids camp, we have youth camp. So for a period of eight or nine weeks, there's such a massive emphasis in summer because they're out of school on our young people. And what God has done in their lives from some of the littles to some of the oldest has been absolutely incredible this summer. But as we come to the end of the summer and we get ready to start a new school year, that's where it kind of all begins to take a shift. It's very easy to be on a spiritual high in the summertime because you're at home. Pretty much don't have a whole lot going on necessarily around you. You get to go to a Bible camp, or you get to go be a, not only go to a Bible camp for youth, maybe as youth even become a, a junior counselor with the kids, you're a helper during vacation Bible school. So there's such a spiritual emphasis in the summer that it's easy to kind of uh, be spiritual minded, for lack of a better term. But it gets a little bit different when the school bus starts rolling. And the school bell starts ringing, and now all the kids, all those things, those opinions of the world, and all of those attitudes of the world, and all those things that drive our culture now are right there in front of you once again. And I believe that we take this opportunity each year to talk to not only our parents, and I'll tell you, tell you right now, even if you do not have children, you are spiritual parents to the kids in this church. Amen. Did you hear me? Some people say, well, you know, preacher, that message really wasn't for me because I don't have children. Yeah, you do. Because I can tell you the kids in this church are watching you at church Amen. and at Walmart and at Winn-Dixie as much as our biological children watch their parents at home. If you don't think so, you should hang around my office sometime. I find out all kinds of good stuff on folks around here. Some of our youngins sing like canaries, y'all. Now y'all paranoid and nervous, aren't you? Y'all better suck up to them kids, that's all I gotta tell you. I want to take an opportunity today to look at Psalm 127 and 128, and I want us to look at parenting, but not only just parenting and parents, but as spiritual parents as well. Because what we do on the outside of church absolutely impacts what goes on inside the church. Amen. We cannot fool ourselves in thinking that we can be Christ-like on Sunday and be like the rest of the world the other six days, and it, and it all work. It doesn't happen that way. No, no different than if Susie and I, we've been married, next month will be 24 years. I'll tell you what, the things I have had to put up with. No, I'm just <laughs> She was just saying, and I won't deny some of them. Say, so, hey, that's pretty good. But if if we had decided on that day at Park New Baptist Church in Gainesville, we got married and we said our vows, if we decided that, you know what, we've got a great marital arrangement. We're going to be married and we're going to live together happily ever after on Monday. But the other six days, we're just going to go out and do whatever we want to. Let me put you this way. We wouldn't have been married 24 years. Because no relationship could possibly have any level of investment like that. It's no different in our spiritual walk. It is no different in our spiritual walk when we think that we can just live like Jesus one day of the week. But the rest of the week act pretty much like the rest of the world. And there's no more evidence of this than social media. I've heard preachers for years talk about the importance of Christians living as Christians seven days a week. 
But boy, now we get to see non-Christian behavior displayed on social media all seven days of the week. It's amazing how much praising the Lord we can do on Sunday, but how much whining we do on the rest of the week. And it seems like we go from walking on a spiritual high to walking in the worldly low very, very quickly. And I believe not only we kids struggle with this, teens struggle with this. I know you do. Been there, done that. Not the t-shirt. But I know you struggle with these because everybody in this room, as a young person, a teenager, you all struggled with them, didn't you? Regardless of what generation you lived in, you struggled with peer pressure. You struggled with bullying. By the way, bullying is not new. It's just now it has an online dynamic, which has made it very different. But bullying has always been. Bullying has always been. Peer pressure has always been. So when you look at these folks, that kids that you think are old around you, they have dealt with the same issues that you're dealing with right now. The question becomes, how are you going to handle those issues? And how do we handle them as parents? How do we handle them as spiritual parents? And then later looking at how do we handle them as kids? And next week, I want to focus on the kids' perspective of that. But today, I want us to focus on what Psalm 127 and 128 says. Look at this, these two psalms with me. Psalm 127, verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, the children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Psalm 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. In the very heart of your house, your children, like olive plants, all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your youth. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the responsibility as believers that you have given us for the next generation. And Father, we praise you for what you do. We praise you for what you've done. And Father, may everything that is said and done this morning bring you great honor and great glory. For you alone are worthy of our praise. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said amen and amen. 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 If we look at Psalm 127, the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house. Now I want to think about that for just a minute because one of the things that I like to do as a pastor, and I've done it in some of your houses when, when you've invited me to do it, and I've already got a couple more that we're going to be doing here in just a little while, but our home dedications. When people move into a new home or they get a new home and they're just saying, you know what, I want to take this opportunity. I want to have folks from the church come over. I want the preacher to come over. And we just want to bless our home. We just want to pray that God will use our home to be a lighthouse to his kingdom. It will be a place of spiritual growth. It will be, be a beacon to this community. And we pray that prayer and, and we do a, a little certificate there that we hand out. I know some of you guys have those. Some of you have them on your wall. Some of you have them on your, on your, your fire place or wherever the case may be and it is a, or on your what or on your door and what it is it is a reminder that as for that house as Joshua said we're going to serve the Lord Amen. and the Bible says that unless the Lord builds your house it is built in vain I want you to understand one thing very clearly parents very clearly adults those of you who are not only biological parents but those of you who are spiritual parents, for those of you who are impacting the next generation, let me tell you, if you're on planet Earth, you are somehow impacting the next generation. The first point is this. Dedicate your home to the Lord. 
Your, your house is not your own. Your house as a believer is given to you as a great gift by God. It is a blessing that millions of people in the world do not share in. There are a lot of people today that will live their day in a cardboard box. There will be those who will be living their day in tent cities. There are still vast regions of the nation of Haiti that are still living, years after the earthquake, are still living in tents. There are people in Indonesia and in Guatemala today living in tents. But what we have seen in Haiti, what we have seen in Guatemala, what we have seen in Indonesia is a pouring of God's blessing because the believers there have allowed the Lord to build their house even if it's simply a tent. See, we in America have such great abundance. We live in beautiful houses. I'm telling you, some of the houses, some of your houses you live in, they're beautiful houses. But those houses are not your own. Those houses are a gift from God. But those houses are also a place of ministry. If you are a believer, it doesn't matter. That, you know, some people say, well, everybody ought to go to the preacher's house. No, let me tell you, everybody ought to be able to go into any believer's house. You should open up your house for Bible study. You should open up your house to prayer meeting. You should open up your house to prayer time. I remember when we first got our place and we dedicated it to the Lord as, as, as it was, they were bringing it in and buried Bibles. And, and this very church right now, the very foundation that you are sitting on right now, there are Bibles all under the foundation of this building. Because the truth of Scripture remains that unless the Lord builds the house, we build in vain. Parents, spiritual leaders, those impacting the next generation, you must dedicate your house to the Lord. If we do not turn our houses into places of service, we're not building a house as believers. We're just, we're just maintaining brick and mortar. It is not a place of of, uh, that glorifies God. It is, it is, if we selfishly say, this is my place, it's mine, it's not ours, it is God's. For Him to use as He wills it to be. It may even be that you've been pricked in your heart to adopt a child or to bring in a foster child. Matter of fact, I'm kind of celebrating today the fact that I'm getting ready to be a great, great uncle. My nephew and niece in Virginia are getting ready to have a baby today. I'm celebrating that. I'm excited about that. And I remember thinking how awesome it was before they got pregnant with this baby. They had already taken five children into their home as foster kids. One of them they had worked toward adopting, but it turns out the real, the real mother and father came through and, and turned things around and were able to get that baby back into a, a wonderful place again. But I looked at that and I look at folks and, and how we can open up our houses to ministry in that way. Or how we can open up our houses to be a place of sanctuary that if someone says, you know what, I just need somebody to talk to. And we say, come to my house for some coffee and let's break bread together. Mike and I have had great conversations in my house over a cup of coffee. You see Mike today, how excited he was? That's what it looks like when he and I have coffee. <laughs> we start off kind of slow and then by all time said and done, he's shouting, I'm shouting, we're singing and everything else. <laughs> It's great what will happen over a cup of coffee. Amen? Okay, just saying. But when you come together, that's one of the reasons why it seems old-fashioned, but before our Bibles, we like to do cottage prayer meetings. People say, well, you know why we don't do cottage prayer meetings anymore? And I think that's the reason why we don't see revivals working anymore. Because we just have made a revival a place that point on the calendar and not a spiritual time of preparation before that. And that's when we're dedicating our house to the Lord. But when we look a little further in verse 120, in chapter 127, into verse 2, it says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sheep. Now, what does this mean? 
It means, first of all, we're to dedicate our house to the Lord. But the second thing that it means is that we are to trust God to provide for our needs. Amen. Uh oh. Amen. See, that's where it gets kind of tricky. Is trusting God. I'll be honest with you. It's kind of easy to say, you know what? Well, I'm going to dedicate my house to the Lord, and, and we're going to live. We're going to live like godly people in our house, and, and Lord, you just use our house however you want it to be. But then all of a sudden, next thing is this word called trust, and this word called faith, because every there, and all of us in here at some point, including even at this moment, we have needs. We're a needy people. And sometimes it's very easy to say that I'm dedicated to the Lord, but it's a whole other thing to trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. One of the hardest things to put in the trust of God is what? Here it is. God, I believe you for my eternal salvation. I believe that on the last day you're going to raise me from the dead incorruptible. I don't know about my pocketbook. I don't know if you can raise it, God. I don't know if you can resurrect my bank account from the dead. Some of us need some resurrection power in the bank account. Amen. Amen. And we stop trusting in the Lord right about where our rear end is. We can have him in our head. We can profess him in our walk. But something happens about right here. Something takes place right here. And when preachers start, I'll tell you what. I, do you know the last time I preached on tithing, I had a person storm out of this building. And blasted me on Facebook. Tore me asunder. For preaching on time. I believe. That if we can't trust God with our money. How can we trust God with anything else? Because our money touches everything. Susan and I were talking about this last night. Money touches everything. Because we were sitting down looking at the church calendar and saying, you know what? It's about this year we're going to do our Dave, the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University again. Starting in September. Details to follow. But what we learned in there is how we can trust the Lord with our money. And I believe sometimes we want to tip God and we forget about tithing. And trusting in God is in our tithe. Because when we tithe to God, this is what you hear. I would tithe, but there's the problem. The but. <laughs> Just saying. That's where the rub is, right there. And we think that if we give, if we don't give, and, and I'll tell you right now, I'm not telling you what to give. God tells us what to give 10%. I tell you what, I'm glad God says give him 10%. He could have said 90. And God don't need no money. But what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a sacrifice. It is, it is saying, Lord, I'm going to be obedient and give to you to give into the storehouses. This, let me put it to you this way. This church, look around you. How do you like these lights? How do you like this dead projector? Y'all see where I'm going here? How do y'all like these lights? How do you like that dead projector? Not so much. Now why do you think that we have lights but a dead projector? We had money to pay the light bill. But ain't enough money to pay for the projector. Just saying. Guess what I get to do this afternoon? Sit all in on a finance committee meeting. Uh oh. Guess why? Everybody said why? 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 Because for some reason. 
we as believers are not trusting in the Lord for this. Y'all want a fast fact? Summer's always late. We know going to the summer, hey, you know, people are on vacations, that kind of stuff. But let me tell you, the church still operates in the summer. Summer may be a vacation time, but it's not a vacation time from expenses. We still had an almost $800 light bill, regardless of whether it was summer or not. We still had staff to pay, regardless of whether it was summer or not. We still have Sunday school materials we bought, whether it was summer or not. Vacation Bible school. We had camp to send kids and young people to, even though it was summer. We had gas to pick everybody up and bring them to church and provide that great ministry, even though it was summer. But the revenue, now how many of you like numbers? Uh, you know. Our revenue for July was 63% of the budget. Brother Jared, what does that translate into? Trouble. Trouble. <laughs> the good news, the bad news is that's trouble. The good news is the money's here. I know that simply because of doing this, you can kind of give a general head count, because we definitely don't have one of the biggest budgets in the world. If everyone was tithing, this church can make budget, no problem. No problem. I'm telling you right now, no problem. And I'm not basing that on, I don't know how much you make, I don't even know how much you get, I don't care about any of that. But I can tell you this, based on the number of people I see, it should support the budget that we have. Especially with this. Your ministry team leaders in your church are doing a phenomenal job. Because guess what the expenses were? Compared to the budget last month. 73%. 73%. Now, if everyone was tithing and ministry team leaders were running at 73% of the budget, that would mean that after a pretty short period of time, we'd have some extra money to buy a new projector. But right now, guess where it is? Which bills are paid and which ones aren't? Because when you have 63% of budget coming in, and 73, even though that's really good, because, I mean, it could be 100 going out, there's still a deficit there, isn't there? So I say this because if we are going to manage, our, if we are going to dedicate our house to the Lord, our house we live in, we've also got to dedicate the house that we worship in to the Lord. And that is being obedient and trusting in Him. If we trust in the Lord with our family, we got to trust in the Lord with our finances as well. And what I hear is, preacher, you just need to trust in the Lord. I am trusting in the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord absolutely. But what I would like to see is that the, if you are not tithing, that you start tithing and be obedient to God. Now some of you are going to go, yeah, there you go, talking about money again. Yeah, I am. I'm going to talk about money again. I sure am. Because I don't think you want to be sitting in the dark next Sunday. Or we can sit without air conditioning. We can choose what we want to do. Because the reality comes, just like in your house, you choose what gets paid and what doesn't, that happens in this house too. There are no discounts in this house. We don't get free anything in this house. We get the same bills in this house that you guys get. And I get in my house. But we've got to be more obedient in our giving. And that's the bottom line, guys. We've got to be more obedient. Because this is reality. When you have to start cutting budgets, you start cutting ministry. And then when you start cutting ministry, you start cutting the means of outreach to be able to build the kingdom. Understand that. Everything that we do, any resource that we need to get for any anything that happens here, it takes money to get it. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If I want our kids 
to be disciple in the word of God, my responsibility is to make sure that they have quality materials in their hands every week. That costs money. And it costs a lot of money. Materials are not cheap. And I think sometimes, Brother Gerald, now we've all talked about this, and Brother Earl, I think when they put church on it, they double the price. A lot of things where it probably could cost about $50 is going to be $250 because it's in the church. I was asked, I was told one time that I don't know why churches worry because they get, they get free electricity. I would love to know what they're like, where that power company is. Sign us up. But we don't. We pay the same rate as you pay in your house. So part of dedicating our house to the Lord is trusting that God provides for our family at home, but also trusting in God to provide for the family here. But part of that is we have to trust Him at home first, which means we trust Him with our wallet, we trust Him with our time. How are we spending our time? Are we spending time doing things that honors God or not? What about the gifts and abilities? As they say time, talent, treasures. What about the gifts and abilities we have? If you can play an instrument, come on up. We'd love to have you. If you can play, if you, if you say, I'm going to sing a special, it doesn't matter to me if it's yodeling. Come on and give praise to Jesus. If you have a talent, use it for God's glory. You'll see people going breaking bad on karaoke contests, but won't sing in church. They sound like Beyonce on Facebook and won't sing in church. Committing our lives to in our house at home impacts the commitment of this house and our work in this house. Using our time and our talents and our treasures wisely in obedience and accordance with God's word. The third thing we look at is that we have to recognize that our children are a gift from God. And we see that here. It says, behold, in verse 3, it says, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Our children are a blessing. You, you, all children in this church, if you're a child, if you are 18 and under, would you stand? Some of them, of course, I know we're in the back. But so if you were 18 and under, would you stand? These are a heritage from the Lord. These are a blessing from the Lord right here. As parents, you can be seated. As parents, God has entrusted them to each of us as biological parents. Rebecca was entrusted to Susie and I. That's a huge deal. All these kids have parents. God entrusted those children to their parents. But let me take that in our in our house where we live. But in this house, all of us, all of us have been entrusted with these children. Amen. See, there's a dynamic that happens in the house where you live, and there's a, there's a dynamic that happens in the house where you worship. And these children are your children to speak into their lives. And I appreciate the men and women that week after week in this church do that without fail. And I'm telling you, I want to encourage you tonight. If you don't stay home tonight because I'm not going to be up here preaching. Something much more important, honestly, is going to happen. You get to lay hands and pray on these, on these kids tonight. They absolutely need it. We all may need a word, but you're going to get a word this morning. They need a prayer tonight. <laughs> they need not tonight for you to be here. Show them you love them. Show them that you care for them. Pray with them because let me tell you, they may, they may not look, they may not do backflips because you prayed for them. They may not even look like they care, but trust me, they do. <laughs> because just as they are teenagers now, you were the same way when you were teenagers if we talked to your mom and your daddy. But there were women and men in my life growing up that made a vital impact upon me. And I'll tell you what, when I was a kid, I probably absolutely looked like I did not appreciate it. Because kids just don't rap, just don't do, just don't rap that well sometimes. Marcella Wood was my Sunday school teacher. The first Sunday school teacher I ever had was Doris Fisher. Doris Fisher lived right over by Pine Level Baptist Church. I went by her little house just the other day. She went home to be with the Lord years ago, but she was the first Sunday school teacher that ever told me about Jesus. 
And when she had to step down teaching because of her health, Miss Marcella Wood stepped in and she took care of us a whole bunch of raggedy boys. I'll tell you what, I was surprised all of us didn't end up in prison. <laughs> and every week she poured into our life and she prayed over us and she made a mark on my life. Sitting behind me was a tall fellow by the name of Eugene Clark. He lives right over through the woods. There, Eugene is a spiritual warrior in my life, a spiritual father in my life. You know why he's a spiritual father? Because if I started talking in church, he thumped me in the back of the head. <laughs> I love Brother Eugene. Brother Eugene sometimes comes here to our church. We have special things. I love seeing Brother Eugene. Now, Brother, I'll tell you right now, I never turned around and said, oh, thank you, Brother Eugene, for all you did. Now, since I've become an adult, I've told him many times, thank you very much, how much I appreciate what he's done. But then, you know what? Those are things, these are things that, as a kid, I remember these men and women. There are a lot more of them, too, that invested in my life. Sandy Clark invested in my life. I love Sandy Clark. That was Eugene's wife. And I just loved her because she always came in with a happy attitude. I love Miss Hattie, too. Oh, Miss Hattie too was awesome because it didn't matter if that poor woman could hardly go. She was behind that piano playing every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday night without fail. And Miss Doris Mosley was swinging that arm to time. <laughs> Don't know what I'm talking about. These are men and women who made a difference in my life, and you've got those too. Let's be that for these guys. Let's one day these guys stand up in front of people and say, you know what? Brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they touched my life. Ian blessed my heart today. He came by and he says, I just wanted to take get a hug from my favorite preacher. i tell you what. You know what? I could go to the house. I'm just like, that just sealed the deal right there. Just love that. And I love these youngins. They know I love them too. Every single one of them. Even if they do get in trouble sometimes. <laughs> So y'all can pray. But we've got to recognize our children, they are a blessing of God, and God has entrusted them with us. And I believe that that goes back to trusting in God to provide for the needs here because he's entrusted that we are going to give them the best biblical education that we can possibly give. And next is we've got to be ready. This kind of walks into next week a little bit, but we, as parents and as spiritual parents, we have got to be ready to prepare our children to make a difference. Look at verse in chapter 127 and verse 5. It says, Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies. Making an impact is what it is all about. Our prayer for these young people is that they will make a difference where they go. The world's going to try to make an influence on them. Our prayer is that they make an influence on the world. Yeah. Next Saturday morning, you get to gather with me and Kevin and who all else is there and prayer walk our schools. I'll tell you what, Kevin was absolutely right. The first year, we started doing this years ago, and the first year we started prayer walking to schools, we had teachers, I had teachers coming to Susie, teachers coming to Michelle, teachers coming to Roger, and saying, we have noticed something different this year. Thank you for praying at our schools. <coughs> First Baptist of Dowling Park is known for prayer. Well, I guarantee you there are two principals that will be watching to see if Dowling Park shows up to pray around their schools next Saturday. Because we've done it every single year. Rain, shine. We have prayed in the rain, even if we can just drive around schools and pray. We've had to do that. But boy, if we get to walk, and you get to walk those sidewalks, and sometimes we even get to go into the building itself and walk the hallways. Pray over those classrooms. And pray over those schools. And I'll tell you what, Ken said it best. Prayer does change things. It makes a difference. And I believe that as we're, if we want our children to make a difference, and that's what we say, that's what we say, well, let's put our money where our mouth is. Show up tonight at 5 o'clock, let's pray for our kids to make a difference. Because there's a whole lot more of them, those kids that are not Christian than are even in our neighborhoods. So our kids need all the uplifting. They need all the encouragement they can get because when they walk into school next Monday morning, they're going to face hell itself right there at the door. Amen. <laughs> and we got to pray for them. Now, unless your eyes are falling out or you end up in an emergency room, I hope you don't. Be here tonight at 5 o'clock. And let's make it a mess. And invite your neighbor. 
Invite your friends. Say, you know what? We're praying for our kids tonight. We're going to we're coming together as a church, and we want to see God make a huge impact through our kids. Bring your kids here. We'll pray for them too. Get on the phone tonight. Invite some folks. But then we've also got to be prepared if we look at verse 128. It says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. What does that mean? We're to model godliness in our family. This kind of goes back to the first. We're to dedicate our home to the Lord. We're to dedicate the place where we live. We're to dedicate the place where we worship. But we are also to be uh, a preparing our children to make a difference as we model godliness in our family. And parents, this happens right there in your house. That's where they meet Jesus first is in the house. Grandparents, that's where they meet Jesus first in your house. But then they come here, do they see Jesus in this church? Do they see Jesus in the lives of God's people here? Are we modeling our lives after the Lord? And lastly is this, and we'll pick up more of this again next week. But in Psalm 128, verse, start with verse 2. It says, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. It shall be well with you. Then it says, your wife will be a fruitful vine. Your children are going to be like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion. And he has. What, what, how did God bless us out of Zion? Through Jesus Christ. May you see the good of Jerusalem. It's speaking of Jesus Christ. May, G, may the goodness of Christ radiate through our life and may we rejoice in the blessing of God. And in verse 6, yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon all of Israel. Peace be upon God's people. Because at the end of the day, when all things are said and done, when we put our head down on the pillow, may we just simply rejoice in God's blessing in our life. And if we start by dedicating our home to the Lord and wrap the day up by rejoicing for God's goodness, I'm going to tell you this, you're going to get a good night's sleep. You're going to get a good night's sleep. You know why? Because you're going to trust God to deal with that money issue. You're just going to give that to God. God you, you, it's all yours anyway. You deal with the money issue. Those kids, those grandkids that are of the world and in the world and doing their thing, you're going to say, Lord, I, I trust them to you. And any other troubles, health problems, or things, Lord, I cannot control it. I cannot have sovereign hand on it, but you can. And I trust it to you. And then you can get a great night's sleep. I believe sometimes we don't sleep as Christians because we haven't done all that stuff in the middle. We haven't trusted in the Lord. We haven't asked ourselves, God, how can I make an impact on the people around me? We've not allowed God to work through our talents. We've not allowed God to work through our time. And so at the end of the day, we, have, we don't rejoice like we should because there's a hollow cavity in the middle of that process. But if we can go through this and say, I'm dedicating my house to the Lord. I'm trusting in the Lord for, to provide for my family. I'm going to recognize that the children that are around me, whether they're mine or somebody else's, they are a blessing from the Lord. I want, to, I want the kids around me, I want the people that I impact, I want to make a difference in their life so that they will make a difference in somebody else's. I want people to see Jesus in me. And then I'm going to lay down my head at night and I'm going to say thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon me. And I'm going to get a great night's sleep. I'm going to wake up the next morning ready to do it all over again. May we sing the praises of Zion, the great blessing of Jerusalem. Jesus has provided for us, guys. Jesus has provided the way. He has provided all the resources that we need. He simply says, trust in me. No if, ands, or buts about it. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Everyone will stand. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've had to gather in your name. As we sung songs of praise to you, Lord, Lord, you, there's been a sweet aroma of praise in this house today. 
Lord, thank you for the praise reports and the prayer requests that have been lifted before your throne today. We thank you and we praise you. We praise you for the abundance of blessings, Lord. And there are so many needs within the church family, within our community right now. There's, there's emotional healing that is needed today. There's financial healing that is needed today. There's relational healing that is needed today. There's a work healing, vocational healing that is needed today. There's familial healing that is needed today. Father's oh, physical healing. There's mental healing. Lord, we are a needy people. And Father, we ask and we trust in you. We ask God that you touch our needs today with your mighty strong hand. We need you, Lord. We need you. Oh, how we need you. Lord, fill us with your presence. Speak to your people. As every head is bowed, every eye closed.